indoor air pollutants are pollutants we find indoors and they can come from natural sources like radon underground or mold spores or they can come from man-made sources like VOCs from furniture and flooring. Indoor air contains a higher concentration of pollutants than outdoor air. And a lot of this is due to our attempts at reducing heat loss and increasing efficiency, ironically. The ventilation systems don't remove air, and windows tend to be kept closed, and this means air is kept inside, which allows pollutants to build up indoors. Now, the average American spends about 90% of their time indoors, so exposure to these pollutants is quite high. All of these indoor pollutants can lead to sick building syndrome a condition associated with unhealthy indoor environments, but the symptoms of this is hard to trace back to any one particular pollutant. Indoor air pollution is highest in the developing world, and it stems from the burning of wood or charcoal indoors with very little ventilation. Due to the buildup of carbon monoxide and particulate matter, rates of pneumonia, asthma, heart disease, and cancer are increased due to the poor indoor air quality. This leads to about 1.6 million deaths per year in the developing world linked directly to indoor air pollution. Now, as far as here, your stoves at home, though they burn mostly methane, which tends to burn relatively cleanly, can still result in the production of carbon monoxide and particulate matter. In the United States, the number of deaths contributed to poor indoor air quality is about 6,000 annually. The two most dangerous air pollutants are secondhand smoke from cigarettes, and radon gas. See, cigarette smoke has more than 4,000 dangerous chemicals when burned, which can lead to everything from eye irritation to lung issues, and of course, we all know that it can lead to cancer. Radon, on the other hand, is a bit more insidious. Radon is a naturally occurring gas that is part of the decay chain of uranium. Radon can enter homes through any crack in the foundation and like open windows. Radon is radioactive and therefore can lead to cancer. In fact, radon is the number one environmental cause of lung cancer and the second largest contributor to lung cancer deaths. That said, many modern homes are radon resistant and you can reduce your risk of radon exposure by ensuring there are no cracks in your foundation, floors, or around pipes. The EPA also has radon test kits available, which I recommend everybody do. Basements with poor ventilation especially have a big risk of a radon buildup, so if you're in the basement playing Fortnite all day, I really suggest you test the air. Now, because radon is a result of the decay of uranium, it's easy to predict which areas are at highest risk based on, well, where we have the most uranium deposits. Because the United States has some of the highest concentrations of naturally occurring uranium, especially in the central U.S., wait, Chicago's part of that. Ah, good thing I got my test kit from the EPA. Another common indoor pollutant is asbestos. Asbestos is a material that has been used for insulation, and the reason it's been used is because it's a very good insulator, and it's also naturally fire resistant. That said, the fibers are practically like small shards of glass, and when breathed in, can lead to cancer, especially mesothelioma, which I'm sure you've seen commercials for. Now, asbestos is only dangerous when it's exposed, so if it's behind a wall, it's generally safe enough. But the use of the substance for insulation has been banned. Another indoor air pollutant can be lead, which has been used in water pipes, and it used to be found in paint. Now, lead is a potent neurotoxin, and the use of lead in paint has been banned. Actually, the use of lead everywhere has been significantly limited, but many lead pipes still exist. More on that in a video on water pollution. Mold is another indoor air pollutant. It's a naturally occurring fungi, much like yeast. It's found virtually everywhere and generally isn't too big of a problem unless you're allergic to it. Now, there are types of mold, however, that are toxic. Black mold, for example, can lead to respiratory issues and prolonged exposure can be harmful, but it's more or less easily removed. Volatile organic compounds are most concentrated indoors because they are released from furniture, wall paneling, carpets, actually just about anything that contains a scent, like body sprays too. The most common type of VOC found indoors is formaldehyde, which can be carcinogenic. Now, the best way to reduce the risk of any indoor air pollutant is to maintain good ventilation by just letting air out. Open a window every now and then and keep your house clean to avoid mold growth, dust buildups, or 
any additional harmful VOCs. Now let's go back to harmful outdoor air pollutants and look at ways to reduce those. Since the majority of pollution is a result of energy production, energy efficiency is key. Right? Adjusting your thermostat to reduce the use of heat and air conditioning is a simple thing we can all do. Like your parents probably told you, if it's cold, put on a sweater. The purchasing of energy efficient appliances is also helpful. The Energy Star program is run by the EPA and provides information on how efficient appliances are. Appliances with the Energy Star label are the best choices and will save money on electricity. Some buildings can also be built efficiently and that's the LEED certification program. There's different classifications of this, but the main goal is energy efficiency, right? Good insulation and make sure that sun exposure is limited during the summer and maximized during the winter. Cities can also reduce the amount of pollution from cars by expanding public transit systems. The fewer people driving, the better. Incentivizing the purchase of battery electric vehicles and hybrids by offering tax credits is also an option. Federal governments can do work too. The United States offers a federal tax credit for the installation of solar panels, which aside from lowering the tax rate for homeowners can also save money on electricity. In a particularly efficient area, you can actually sell electricity back into the grid. Cars are a major source of pollutants in cities and cars have some technology to reduce the amount of pollutants they release. Because gasoline is a VOC, which I'm sure you've noticed the smell of it anytime you go by a gas station, many gas stations use vapor recovery nozzles, which prevents the gasoline fumes from escaping while you fill up. Many cars now also have a built-in vapor recovery system to reduce the amount of VOCs entering the air. Cars also have a part called the catalytic converter, Choose a series of metals and other compounds that react with common car emissions, reducing the amount released. Now, reducing is the key word here. All of these technologies simply reduce the amount of pollutants, not eliminate. But that's beside the point. A catalytic converter converts nitrogen oxides to nitrogen gas and carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Now, the CO2 is a bad greenhouse gas, but at the very least, at least it's not toxic. It also reduces the release of other hydrocarbons that went unburned from the engine to water and carbon dioxide. Gases released from power plants are also treated to reduce their impact. And there are two pieces of technology here. An electrostatic precipitator takes advantage of the negative charge on many air particulates. They contain positively charged metals inside which attract the particles, stopping them from being discharged. Wet scrubbers work by spraying outgoing gases with water and a few other chemicals. Remember how sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides react with water? This reduces the amount of those pollutants released by reacting them with water. They, they're literally just sprayed down. Right? The water sprays the gas as it leaves and the wastewater is captured and disposed of. There are also dry scrubbers which instead use an absorbing material to filter out the pollutants. They are, however, not as effective as dry scrubbers, but they are cheaper. Mm. At the end of the day, the best pollution control mechanism we have is legislation. The Clean Air Act was introduced in 1970. It was amended to provide more environmental protections in 1977 and 1990. What the Clean Air Act did was establish national ambient air quality standards. It sets the limit on how many of the six criteria pollutants can be released. The agency in charge of enforcing this is the EPA, and they have programs available to help industries meet these standards. Overall, this legislation has been a success. Just about every single pollutant that is regulated has seen a substantial decrease. The legislation also incentivized many industries to modernize, creating about 570,000 jobs. It saved $22 trillion in healthcare costs associated with treating diseases caused by pollutants and has prevented up to 230,000 premature deaths. The 1990 amendment introduced a market approach to limiting pollution by introducing a cap and trade program. The way cap and trade works is well, the government sets a strict limit on the amount of pollutants that can be released. Old power plants that aren't as efficient struggle to hit these goals, while newer power plants can easily stay below the required levels. What cap and trade does is it allows newer, more efficient plants to sell whatever pollutants they don't release below their level to older power plants. 
older power plants will purchase these shares, allowing them to emit above the cap. This results in an overall lowering of emissions because the old power plants are offset by the newer, more efficient ones. This also incentivizes efficiency and modernization of power plants and limits the burden of older power plants. So, yay, jobs, money saving, and cleaner environment. Go team! <sighs> With all this technology and legislation, air pollution is still a problem, both globally and in the United States. More can be done by introducing newer legislation, which further incentivizes the development of newer, greener technology. Uh, provide more incentives for municipalities to switch to renewable sources of energy and set even stricter limits on pollutants. Now, <laughs> you may have noticed carbon dioxide wasn't really mentioned here. That's because carbon dioxide is not listed as a criteria pollutant by the EPA. That's because it's technically not toxic, even at high concentrations that are produced by cars or power plants. There has been a massive lobbying effort by the energy sector to prevent governments all around the world from passing legislation limiting carbon dioxide production. The United States actually pulled out of one of the biggest attempts at this when we pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, which would have held nations accountable to reducing their CO2 emissions. Now, despite carbon dioxide not being toxic, it is the largest contributor to global warming by producing the greenhouse gas effect which we will go over when we get to the Global Climate Change Unit. But do know that carbon dioxide is not listed as a pollutant for political reasons, not because the scientific community doesn't consider it a pollutant, so there is some wishy-washy stuff in there. Ugh. We could do better. <laughs>